Well, good morning, a very warm welcome to St Mary's Spenley for our worship today. It's wonderful to be able to welcome you to worship and we're delighted that Eric is going to be sharing God's word with us later on in the service. But as we prepare ourselves for worship, shall we pray? Dear Lord, our mighty God, as we, your faithful people, come humbly before you, open our eyes to see the wonder of your power. Allow your light of glory to shine upon and within us as we joyfully offer a worship and praise. Amen. And so we come to our words of confession. Shall we pray? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that through your Son, Jesus Christ, we find forgiveness and wholeness. And we come to you today in recognition of our sins. 
We are sorry and sad for the things that we have done that have harmed others or harmed your image in us. Help us to begin each new day afresh in the light and love of your forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. The reading is taken from Jeremiah 31 verses 7 to 9. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labour. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble, because I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my firstborn son. The reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. The healing of blind Bartimaeus. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want from me? What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my lips and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. If Jesus was standing in front of you now and asked you the question, what do you want me to do for you? What might your answer be? What do you want me to do for you? It's a question that Jesus asks twice in Mark's Gospel. As we saw last week, he asked it of James and John when they came to him with a request. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus replied, Well, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left uh, in your glory. They wanted Jesus to give them status and power and glory. By contrast, the blind beggar's response to Jesus' question, What do you want me to do for you? is far simpler. I want to see. It's about the nature of true discipleship, what it really means to be a follower of Jesus, a faithful follower of Jesus. As we'll explore briefly, it's a theme that's been running through Mark's Gospel for a few chapters now. And maybe our response, our reply to Jesus' question, what do you want me to do for you? will give us some insight into our own discipleship and where we are with Jesus at this time in our life 
and what lessons we might still need to learn from him. James and John's request to Jesus and the subsequent anger of the other disciples led to Jesus teaching them more about the nature of discipleship. They hadn't got it, despite his continuing teaching. Blind Bartimaeus' answer to his question led to quite a different response from Jesus. Jesus immediately healed him, his sight was restored, he could see clearly. The healing of Bartimaeus is the second healing of a blind man that Mark records for us. The first is recorded back in chapter 8. You remember, you may remember that that healing took Jesus two goes to bring about the complete healing of the blind man's sight. Uh, the first time we're told that Jesus spat in his eyes and put his hands on him and Jesus asked the man if he could see anything. I can see people, he said, but they're like trees walking about. Once more, Mark tells us, Jesus places his hands on him and the, the man's eyes were opened, his sight was restored and he could see clearly, everything clear. And we're left asking, well, did Jesus really need to take two stages to heal this man's blindness? Was this a particular difficult, particularly difficult case for someone who could raise the dead to life? Or was Jesus perhaps using it as an illustration? The disciples up till this point were taking so long to work out who Jesus was. Do you still not understand? He had said to them in exasperation shortly before this healing. Don't you get it? Can't you see even now? And immediately after this two-stage healing, Peter gets it. You are the Messiah, he declares. He gets it, but he doesn't really. It's as if he's at the first stage of his, having his eyes opened. The people are like trees. He gets who Jesus is, but he doesn't get what that means for Jesus. He can't get his head round the fact that it means that Jesus is going to have to suffer and die on the cross. And that's a key part of what awaits him. If he is to fulfill his role as Messiah, he must suffer. And that to be a follower of Jesus means taking up our cross, denying ourselves and following him. So the two-stage healing of the blind man's sight acts as an illustration of how slow the disciples were to get it, to see, to understand who Jesus is and what following him means. And even now, chapter 10, after they've made their journey from Caesarea of Philippi to the last town before Jerusalem and the cross, the disciples hadn't got it. Cut back to Bartimaeus now. Bartimaeus, who in desperation cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David. It's another way of saying Messiah. He publicly acknowledges who Jesus is and his response to Jesus' question, what do you want me to do for you, is simple and straightforward. Rabbi, I want to see. I want to see. His healing is immediate. And now here he is following Jesus as he makes his way into Jerusalem and to the cross as he fulfills his calling as Messiah, son of David. He had thrown his cloak, his only possession, thrown it aside to get to Jesus, and now here he is following Jesus. Peter, often regarded as the leader of the disciples, couldn't get that Jesus had to suffer on the cross. 
nor did he seem to get what following Jesus actually would mean. The rich man, who earlier in chapter 10 had approached Jesus wanting to know what he had to do to inherit eternal life, wouldn't give up his riches to follow Jesus. James and John thought that following Jesus was a way to get status and power and glory. They thought perhaps that Jesus owed them a bit of a favour. After all, they followed him around for three years now. And Bartimaeus, a blind beggar who operated at street level, who owned nothing more than a cloak, someone of no status, who relied on handouts from others to live and was regarded as of no worth, saw and followed. He could see who Jesus is and he wanted nothing more than to be with him. His opened eyes, an illustration of what it is to see Jesus in all his glory. So where is all this going? How does it help us understand the true nature of discipleship? What it means to be a follower of Jesus? Well, let's consider the characters again. There's Peter, who was to go on to be a key figure in the establishment of the worldwide church, whose discipleship then was flawed because he had fixed ideas on how things should be, on how God should do things, and wasn't prepared to accept that he might be wrong. There's a rich man who would have been regarded by his contemporaries as blessed by God, who as far as we know never took the step of following Jesus because he was not prepared to leave his wealth behind. There's James and John, beloved disciples, who nonetheless tried to make Jesus a means to an end. In the same way as the prosperity gospel today, which promises us riches that were faithful to Jesus, makes Jesus nothing more than a means to an end. Well, incidentally and encouragingly, well, I take encouragement from it, from it. Jesus doesn't give up on Peter or James or John. He rather takes time to teach them more about the nature of discipleship and who he is. That's how he deals with us today, with infinite patience, thankfully. And then there's Bartimaeus the main character in our reading apart from Jesus. A blind beggar, a nobody, who Mark presents to us as a model disciple, a true follower of Jesus, who gave up what little he had in order to get close to Jesus, who saw Jesus in all his suffering, and humble glory and who longed simply to be with him not looking for anything other than to be in his presence and to walk in his ways if Jesus was to say to you now what do you want me to do for you what would your answer be?
thou my breastplate, my sword for the fight. Be thou my whole armor, be thou my true might. Be thou my soul shelter, be thou my strong tower. Oh, raise thou me heavenward. Riches I need not, no man's empty praise. Be thou mine inheritance now and always. Be thou and thou only the first in my heart, O sovereign of heaven. life through Christ and illuminate our way. Guide us to see fully the needs of those around us, whether obvious or subtle. We pray that your church would be a place of welcome and encouragement to all who are seeking a way through the struggles of everyday life. Strengthen our faith and help us not to turn away from all who need our help. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, we pray for our families, friends and neighbours. We give thanks for the loving relationships and for the kindness and courage to see through those around us. Yet help us to remember that for many, life is difficult and scary. Comfort and give vision to those whom the day is long and fear is overwhelming. Comfort and give hope to those who are let down, rejected and empty. Comfort and give light to those who are confused, lonely or sad. Comfort and bring healing to those who are sick, suffering or mourning. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, the people of the world cry out in fear and poverty through op oppression and war and disaster. Open the eyes of governments and leaders to see a better way Help them to recognise that a new perspective is needed and grant them insight and wisdom to make a right decisions. We give thanks for the agencies who work to bring relief to the dark and forgotten places and we ask for a candle of hope to be lit in the hearts of all those who feel lost. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, send your Holy Spirit upon us to wake us and shake us and stir us, to call, us, call out for justice, goodness and peace. Help us to take heart in knowing that Jesus hears us and never leaves us. Amen.
And so we come to our news and notices. A few things to remind you of. Firstly, um, we'd like to say a very big thank you to everyone who not only helped clean church after the scaffolding came down, but also uh, for the harvest donations as well that have gone to support the work of the food bank. Also, we're halfway through our celebration of Beverly 1300. Lots of events taking place over the coming days. On Monday, there is, of course, uh, David's talk. David's one of our stonemasons. He'll be talking about what it's like to be a stonemason, to be a journeyman. Uh, if you want to know more about any of the events that are taking place, and indeed, if you want to be part of the Pilgrim Trail that's collecting the scallop shells from church to leave in special places, Please do check out our website uh, for more information or sign up for our notices. We will be giving thanks for the goodness that God uh, gives us in our light party on Saturday the 30th. Um, it's an alternative to Halloween, it's an opportunity for children to dress up and be sparkly if they want to, they don't have to if they don't want to, but to enjoy time together and celebrate the goodness of God's light. Uh, on that particular day. Also, um, if you'd like to come and celebrate David Smith's life, we would love to see you. That's on Saturday the 30th as well. And I know Jennifer is very grateful for your support and prayers at this time. We're very much aware that the infection rates around COVID has been going up. And so we'd like to remind you that in church, we invite people to sit on the uh, right hand side of church as you face the altar if you'd like to wear face coverings. Um, we do encourage you to be careful at this time. If you don't want to, we're not going to force you, but please do sit on the other side of church, um, on the left hand side of church as you face the altar. And please do check out our website for everything that's taking place. Lots and lots is going on. If you want to know more about anything that's going on, want to talk to anybody, please do call our office on 01482 869 137. Thank you. So may God who brings light and life, God who brings insights and opens our hearts and eyes to his work, may he bless us and keep us. And the blessing of God Almighty, 
Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.